most wild cats have evolved a way to live with a virus closely related to one that is decimating humans. The story was unraveled by Stephen O'Brien, here at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., to examine a tranquilized cheetah. Well, we originally became interested in the cats because I was interested in the interplay between infectious diseases and the genes of the species that suffer them. We began working with cheetahs and subsequently started to study each of the 37 different species in the cat family. What we're learning from them is that they are mirrors of evolutionary processes in humans. It all began in the 1980s, when O'Brien became concerned that small populations of endangered cats were especially vulnerable to the ravages of infectious disease. Then he heard that domestic cats were falling prey to a newly discovered and lethal virus, the feline immunodeficiency virus, or FIV. FIV is associated with very skinny and malnourished and wasting disease in house cats. And that disease was the result of the collapse of the immune system. So the parallels with human immunodeficiency virus were very strong. I was curious as to whether or not the virus had also been able to infect non-domestic cats. O'Brien had collected biological specimens from thousands of wild cats around the world. He began to screen them for the presence of the virus. Well, when we did that in cheetahs from East Africa and the pumas in, in the Rockies and the ocelots down in the Andes and the lions in the Serengeti, it turned out that virtually every species of cats on the planet had been exposed to and infected with a version of feline immunodeficiency virus. Well, I was terrified because I thought that we were just a heartbeat away from a epidemic that was going to decimate some of these cats. And since 36 of 37 of these cat species are already considered endangered or threatened, then this could be the final wallop. For years, O'Brien feared the worst. He urged zookeepers and game wardens around the world to test their animals for the virus and to watch for AIDS-like symptoms. What we discovered, though, over time, is that these cats were really not getting ill. It was as if they had somehow come up with a resistance to a fatal virus. O'Brien's research suggests FIV first infected the cat's ancestors around one million years ago. It decimated the animals, but a few cats carried mutations that made them resistant to the virus. These survivors passed on their protective genes to their offspring and to most wild cats alive today. Over time, the virus may also have evolved into less lethal strains. Today, wild cats and FIV have reached the end of a long evolutionary process and have adapted to each other. We all bear the marks of our ancestors' struggle for survival. But evolution is driven not just by conflict and competition, Cooperation and teamwork have also ensured the survival of the fittest. Toward the end of the 20th century, biologists began to realize that there's another force, equally important and responsible for the buildup of a great deal of the magnificent superstructure of the Earth's biodiversity, and that is cooperation what we call symbiosis, and particularly mutualistic symbiosis. That is, intimate living together of different kinds of organisms in which there is a partnership which benefits both of the partners. Nature abounds in symbiosis. Many species depend on a partner for their very survival. 
A grouper enjoys a cleaning as tiny shrimp eat the parasites on its skin. Anemones give safe harbor to clownfish who bring food and chase off predators. With nectar and pollen, flowers entice birds and bees to help fertilize them. Most plants rely on fungi living on their roots to extract nutrients from the soil. And grazing animals could not digest their diet without the bacteria that live in their gut and break down plant matter. We too are symbiotic creatures. Beneficial bacteria cover every inch of our skin and the length of our intestines. They help digest food, produce vitamins, and keep dangerous microbes out. Symbiosis has deep roots in the history of life. Some 50 to 60 million years ago, just after the age of the dinosaurs, two species formed a lasting bond here in the dense thicket that will become the Amazonian rainforest. A big mature at a nest. These huge mounds of earth are the product of that partnership, one that brought Ted Schultz and Ulrich Müller to a remote corner of Brazil. The unlikely excavators of all this dirt are leafcutter ants. Look, they're bringing stuff in there. There's some forges here, mm -hmm. starting. Yeah. Leafcutter ants make their nests in underground chambers. They emerge regularly to forage, blazing trails that extend hundreds of feet into the forest. Most tropical plants are permeated with toxic chemicals, a deterrent against browsers. The ants cut fresh vegetation, but they don't eat it. They feed it to another organism. Foragers carry their cargo down into the nest and turn it over to smaller worker ants. They clean the leaf fragments and chew them into a pulpy mulch. Leafcutters cultivate a fungus that breaks down the toxins in the leaves and swells with proteins and sugars. This is the ant's food. Both the ants and the cultivated fungus are dependent on each other for living. The ants need the fungus as a food they're dependent on it, you take away the fungus, they will die. In reverse, the fungus cannot do without the ants. So it's a mutual codependency. A mature colony of leafcutter ants can consist of as many as eight million individuals, and they're the dominant herbivores of the New World tropics. They take an estimated 15 to 20 percent of all the fresh vegetation. A mature colony of Atta leafcutter ants are the equivalent of an adult cow sitting in the middle of the rainforest um, foraging on the vegetation in their immediate area. The entire rainforest is affected by the symbiosis of ant and fungus. To understand how it evolved, Schultz and Müller collect ant nests throughout Latin America. Here's one. Where? Oh, yeah. An experienced eye can spot the subtle signs of a young nest, founded perhaps six months ago when a new queen left home with a bit of fungus in her mouth and burrowed into the ground. <laughs> 